everyone, and welcome to Found Friday. Um, this week we have a special guest joining us, Brett Relander, founder of Launch and Hustle, an entrepreneur magazine contributor and frequent digital marketing speaker. Uh, this week we're going to discuss digital marketing trends and specifically talk about how to finish this year strong and make sure that we're setting up 2015 for success because um, it's really about making sure that we're taking best practices and applying them. Um, I'm your show host, Aaron Robbins O'Brien, CEO of Ginza Metrics. Uh, as always, you can tweet to us directly during the show using the hashtag Found Friday. Make sure it's all one word. Um, or send comments and suggestions uh, using our blog comment option after the show or the contact form on Ginza Metrics, and we'll try to take your suggestions for improvement. So let's kick things off. Uh, Brett, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing over at Launch and Hustle and why you decided to start the company um, you know, to, to help out with marketing? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Launch and Hustle was started um, primarily because of my passion around entrepreneurship and small business and really wanted to kind of close the gap for um, the small to medium sized businesses that are out there when it comes to kind of modernizing their business. So um, I'm from a very small town in Illinois originally, I'm in the Dallas area now, but um, small town meaning like 3,700 people, right? So extremely small, my dad's a small business owner and has been his entire life. So I've always grown up around that. I always had an affinity really for, for small businesses and really trying to help you know, the mom and pop type places and the smaller, smaller businesses achieve more. Um, my experience within digital marketing and in particular within mobile and social media um, has put me in a position to really try to be able to bring um, a certain level of, of modernization to a lot of businesses that aren't there yet. Um, try to bring you know, really enterprise level tools and uh, enterprise level marketing channels. Um, to the small business so that they can leverage those in the same way that they enjoy you and um, take it, get all the, all the advantages that come along with it. It's great to hear from someone who is specifically focusing on problems for small business owners or for you know a segment that typically gets ignored by the big players, the, the tool providers and things like that that are looking for, you know, uh, you know, huge returns, tons of users, multiple sites, you know, kind of all of that. And agencies, you know, have a tough time too because traditionally a small business owner can't afford a large agency fee. Um, so it's great to see that you're, you're really focused on doing that. And I know that your price points start at things that are really accessible to everyone. So um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, why that's important. So let's start off by discussing kind of the current state of the, the digital marketing industry. Um, what do you think of where things are right now in terms of both what consumers are dealing with uh, from being marketed to digitally and what marketers are now trying to kind of combat? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot, right? I mean, it's, um, and it's, it's not really, I, I do some consulting too for, for, for large enterprises as well. Like, so, and, and the funny thing is, some of the same challenges that SMBs are facing, really the enterprises are facing them as well. Their challenges are a little bit different in, in what the challenges are, but ultimately how, when we're talking about social media and mobile marketing and that sort of thing, they're facing a lot of the same, the same challenges as far as understanding it, understanding how to, how to use it correctly, what the return on investment is and all of that. So um, that, that's, it's, it's ironic because most people probably wouldn't expect that, but um, it's, it's certainly the case. With as far as consumers are concerned, um, I mean, the biggest thing I think that they are challenged with today is an overload of information. Um, there's really, there's really um, a lot of noise out there. I mean, it's difficult with you know streams on Twitter, with Facebook, with you know, just on Google itself, um, et cetera, to really be able to have a message resonate with them. Um, to a to a point where it where it's remembered. Um, there's actually been studies out there that, that I reference often around um, how how people have started to lose the ability to retain information short term because we all know we have instant access to it anytime we want because of the internet. So we because we know we don't have to remember it because we can go back and find it anytime we want to and, and very quickly and easily. We tend to remember less, and, and that that in itself provides a challenge then for for marketers um, and really making sure that their brand is going to be the one that they think of, that a consumer thinks of when it's time to you know go to dinner, when it's time to go buy new shoes, when it's time to do whatever you know, whatever the, the, the case um, may be, and 
Go ahead. I was wondering, I mean, do you think that because of this, uh, just like overload of information and inability to remember kind of short-term things, which is a problem for both consumers and marketers, um, do you think that consumers are becoming more discerning, more investigative in their decision-making process now that they've got all this information, or do you think it's actually having the converse effect and they see something interesting on, uh, you know, Twitter or on a video, and then they kind of just say, "Hey, sure, I'll, I'll go purchase that." Um, I think I think it's I think it varies based on based on individual experience. So. If someone who maybe has had a bad purchasing experience in the past um, may go and spend more time looking for reviews, spend more time um, going through the process of doing their due diligence ultimately before a purchase. Um, other people, you know, purchasing in many cases, and in the kind of industry specific as well, is based on emotions, right? If it's based on making an emotional purchase in many cases, it's something that they need or they feel they need um, right then. And I, I think when, when in industries where that's more more the case, then people will tend to probably look at reviews less prior to the purchasing decision because it's more of a decision that's happening at the spur of the moment. It's not really something that they're preparing for. It's not a big purchase. Um, it's it's something that is you know, maybe it's where they're going to go to dinner. I mean, so one of the things that people are talking a lot about with regards to kind of the digital marketing industry is the impact of you know, mobile marketing strategies. And so, you know, marketers are now saying that they feel that mobile will, it is going to be the single largest impact on their business moving forward next year. And it's actually beating out business intelligence, cloud computing, and social media. Um, so I think that, you know, one of the things that everybody would agree with is that mobile is now a way for people to comparison shop, you know, kind of on the fly or to look for better prices or, you know, to look at product reviews really quickly. How are you seeing people kind of incorporate mobile well into a digital strategy? And are there hurdles that you think that, you know, are kind of common pitfalls that people need to really pay attention to? Yeah, I mean, mobile is one of my big things, right? And it's, so it's, it's definitely the here now future of marketing. So searches on mobile devices, so internet searches on mobile devices passed desktop this year. So there's more searches happening on, on mobile phones and mobile you know, iPads, tablets, et cetera, than are happening on people's desktops at this point. So and it's, it's, of course, trending even further up. Um, what, what we see and what, what I really recognize in the market is that ultimately we've got everyone has their own little mini computer in the palm of their hand. And usually and usually within arm's length 24-7, right? So, I mean, I, I use my phone as my alarm clock. You know, I don't have an alarm clock. I don't have a landline. I, I mean, I, I use my phone for really everything, whether it's checking the weather or, you know, checking my Twitter streams or whether it's checking my email or, you know, looking for a place to go to dinner potentially, right? It's, it, it doesn't really, it never leaves my side. It's the lifeline that, you know, we've become, you know, kind of, just tied to you over the last you know, 10 to 15 years really for most of us. And what some of the challenges I think that people face is they don't understand, you know, from a marketer's perspective, they don't really understand the channel as well as they could. Um, they don't understand the, el the different elements of the channel. Um, I mean, there's obviously, you know, there's mobile search, there, you know, there's mobile apps, there's SMS and MMS. You know, there's all these different ways to communicate. And I think because there's kind of a, it's, it hasn't been adopted as, as massively as it could, specifically in the small business sector. And it's primarily been because of at least, at least a, a perception that it's, it's not affordable. Um, I know that, you know, I've developed native apps that were completely or, you know, unique and, and from scratch and, and all that. And it's, it can be extremely expensive. Um, the, there's there's agencies here in Dallas I know that don't take don't, they don't take a, a, a project unless it's over a hundred thousand dollars and that's not doable for most uh, small and medium sized businesses so I mean, that's one of the other reasons we offer mobile apps for for the S SMB space and make sure that we, we can put them on a level playing field where they can they can put their brand on somebody's phone um, so it kind of again it kind of breaks through the noise. You don't have to. They don't have to remember you. That you will literally be sitting on their phone at all times. They don't have to search for you. They don't have to remember what to search for. They don't have to do any of that. It's right there, 
um, you can you push notifications to your you know as a as a as a merchant or as a, a marketer to out uh, to your audience and to drive traffic for a Tuesday night special at your at your restaurant or a retail whatever the case may be. You've got customer loyalty programs on on there, etc. And it really we're really, really trying to level level the playing field, make it so any business, local, um, regional, national, you name it, can have has the ability to have their own app with features in it that can help drive business um, for them. Yeah, I think that it's it's a really interesting point that there's a lot of different facets to mobile that people don't necessarily think about. Um, and you know, you mentioned a few really key things that are going on. Um, so there's mobile search, right, um, which is a huge driver, right? People are looking for something at the time that they need it. Um, there's a huge value to being to, to mobile search and to local search because if somebody is searching for something from their phone, it's probably because that need is fairly immediate. Um, and then if you're there, and then if your site is navigable via mobile, or that you're included on reviews apps appropriately with your correct contact information and things, that somebody has the ability to make that choice then in there, read appropriate information, and get in touch with you directly and easily from that device. So mobile search is a really big thing. Um, you know, and then apps and image services, and like you said, you know, there's SMS and MMS and all these different different facets. Even for folks that may not feel that an app is right for them, I think that there's this idea that you can be correctly included on existing apps, um, and that managing your presence, regardless of, of where the experience is, is really key. Um, and so I, I think that a lot of marketers should probably take a look at just double checking and making sure, is my presence a useful and beneficial one to the consumer at all points that they could potentially interact with us across across a mobile experience, whether that's Yelp or Google Maps or whatever. A lot of times they see that people haven't really set up some of that stuff, and it only takes a second. Um, yeah, you know, marketers yeah. think put themselves in the, in the user's shoes, in the consumer's shoes, and really make sure that they go through the process of doing the actions that a consumer would do. So go do a search on a mobile phone for your business or for you know the keywords that you want to come up for. And find out where you're where you you're ranking for, first and foremost, and then you know do you have your Google Places set up like you mentioned? Do you, do you have a mobile site that's optimized, not the site that shows up on a mobile phone? Because if you got a pinch and pull and all that stuff, you're not nobody's staying there, right? Nobody's staying there. So you got to have that mobile experience, good user experience. So people specifically on mobile devices, like you said, are very action oriented. They're looking for an address. They're looking to make a phone call. They're looking for your hours. They're looking for you know, GPS reference. All those. Kind of those things are kind of the basic foundational things that you've got to make available to people, and, and without a bunch of clicks, it's got to be quick, simple, and easy, and you know, a really good user experience. I think the uh, you know, I think there's a, a misconception that this that these kinds of things cost a lot of money, take a lot of time, or require a huge amount of expertise. There are really small changes that you can make to ensure that people can get a hold of you or that they have kind of an easily navigable experience. Um, so, you know, one thing that I always find <laughs> amusing is uh, stylistically, a few years ago, people decided to put um, periods in between phone numbers as opposed to dashes. But this will mean that for a lot of people on your mobile phone that if you click it, like if you just press it, your phone will automatically dial if you have dashes, but may not if you have periods in between them, right? And so now you're preventing somebody from easily being able to call and set up a reservation or do some other action. So there's a lot of little things that people could look at. And I love that you mentioned keywords and site navigability via mobile. Um, one, because I love me some SEO, and I think it's a hugely undervalued part of kind of the marketing mix. But mobile SEO is so huge. Um, specifically local, right? I mean, you need to be paying attention to mobile and local SEO, and I love the recommendation about what keywords would your audience look for while they're on their phone. Because there's often a very different set of keywords for what somebody would search for from a desktop and what somebody would look for from a mobile device, and you can actually see the difference. You can actually segment those. Um, you know, we, we released that feature at Ginza Metrics earlier this year, and I can tell you it's actually done a lot for, um, for some agency businesses that specifically represent um, heavily consumer-facing folks, um, you know, and I can only imagine that people in the restaurant business and uh, consumer services, so um, salons and you know daycares and, and all kinds of things like that, probably a really great market there. Um, I, I want to touch on a statistic that I was looking at um, from Smart Insights actually yesterday, which is that 46% of marketers do not have a digital marketing strategy. Um, 
I, to prevent myself from saying things that are inappropriate on the air, um, or to be, to be rude, I'm going to throw it over to you and what you think about the fact that half, half of our community um, hasn't developed any sort of digital marketing strategy and, and what kind of that means. I mean, I would say that that means um, that they don't have a marketing strategy at all, if they don't have a digital marketing strategy first and foremost. Um, I think that, you know, it, it's sometimes, specifically for people who are new in the space, it can be uh, a, a little overwhelming. And something that maybe they don't understand as well as they should, and they don't know where to start. And it's very, you know, it's an ADD space, all right. I mean, there's always new things, and there's always new stuff. It's difficult to make commitments to certain tools, and there's always new things coming out. Um, some tools are expensive. Some of them don't have all the features that you want, and you know, you have to piece the little things together. Um, I think that I, I think that they probably overcomplicate the process. Um, in many cases, I've been with organizations before and been consulting with organizations that they really overcomplicate the process of, of strategic planning. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem because ultimately, for me, at the end of the day, you need two things to, to make sure that you're, you're, you're successful with your, with your strategic planning. And it's, it's um, alignment and clarity. If you don't have alignment and clarity on your team, you're in trouble and it's over, right? You need to know where you're going. You need to know how you're going to get there. And you need to be on the same path with your team members walking in that direction. Um, if, if, it's, if it's not to that level where everybody has alignment and clarity, then you're not going to really be as effective as you could. You're not going to reach your potential from a marketing perspective. Um, I use, when I do, when I do consulting, I use a, a, um, a process really that, I, that I've kind of developed over the years. That's, and I just call it, it's the vital few. So many, many, I've been with businesses before. We have, you know, 15 priorities, right? And you can't have 15 priorities and accomplish anything. So I go through a process called the vital few, and ultimately we look at you know, three to four goals. Um, we choose three to four goals that we want to accomplish over the next six to 12 months, um, and we say, and then we quantify those. So there's got to be a number, something that we're measuring against to, to find out whether it's going to be successful or not and see what's working. Um, those are the, in, in, in at the same time, you've got to be careful with who you're talking to during this process, right? Because different levels within an organization, depending on how big an organization is, have different needs from a knowledge and inclusive standpoint through that conversation. So I've been with organizations before where the really at the goal perspective, at the goal place, setting the goals, the C-level people don't need to be involved beyond that. They need to have buy-in on the goals, and that's really about it. They don't, they don't need to understand all the tactics that are going to take place to do it beyond, beyond the budgetary limitations or, or constraints that may be associated with them. Um, they don't need to understand all that other stuff. It's the, it's, it's the managers, um, the directors, and, 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 and that level that really need to make sure that they're, they're involved and, and engaged within the, the process of establishing the tactics and how we're going to do it, what we're going to use, how we're going to measure it, you know, what's the timing of everything, how does it lay out, because ultimately the goals filter down through that, right? They just they filter down through that process. And then once you get that established and you have the buy-in and everybody understands their role within that, within that, then you uh, start to move and accomplish more because everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing each day and where they're going with it, what they're supposed to be accomplishing with it. And they can make decisions and then have more better critical thinking really because they understand, they understand completely where they're going. You know, I think that... Uh one of the one of the really big resonating factors here too is what you said at the very beginning, which is they don't have a marketing strategy if there's not a digital strategy. And I think that um, part of the reason that people that such a large percentage of people said that they don't have a digital marketing strategy is probably for two reasons. One, they're probably doing digital marketing things. There's just not a clear, defined strategy around it. Or two, they feel that digital doesn't necessarily apply to their business. Um, both of these things are crazy to me. Uh, you know. If you're doing digital things but you don't have a strategy, then like if you tell me, oh, well, I don't need a digital marketing strategy because I'm on Twitter and Facebook and I've got um, Yelp or you set up or whatever, and I'm like, well, but if you are do if you're spending time doing this and you don't have a strategy, that means you don't know why you're doing it. That means there's no metrics linked to it. That means there's no benchmarking. That means there's no 
way to actionably take what you're doing there and tie it back to revenue and other business KPIs and make sure that you're actually improving on it, right? Um, and and anytime somebody is spending any time, you know, I don't care if it's 10 or 15 minutes a day, that's time that you're spending doing something that you could be doing, you could be doing something different. So if you're going to do it, you need to make sure that there's a goal for it, that there are some sort of KPIs and objectives going on, and that somebody is measuring something um, from it so that you know what what actually affects change, right? So like let's say when you tweet Friday afternoon specials, you actually see a pop in business, but when you tweet on Wednesday morning pictures of your kitchen, nothing happens. Like maybe what you need to be doing is tweeting more specials, right? So like let's let's try to learn from the experience. Um, the other the other side of that, which is I don't think that digital applies to my world. I mean, I, I don't really know how to combat that um, because I just don't know that I have the brain space to like wrap my head around somebody in 2014, almost 2015, thinking that there is no space for them on the interwebs. Uh, so for me, like if, if you're already doing something digital and you need to figure out how to start developing a strategy. What are your kind of best practices or places that you would tell people how to start creating a strategy? Um, I mean, I would use the process that I was kind of outlining earlier and, and, and apply it to digital. So they, they depends, you know, a little bit on if they have any data now. So do they have, I'm assuming they've got a website. I would hope that they've got some sort of analytics, even at a Google Analytics level. Maybe they know something about the personas of their customer base, right? Who, the, who, who they are, what do they, what do they look like, um, and, and what's that, what's that target market? And then, if you've got at least some basic foundational information, then you can start to look, start to do some homework, and you can kind of lay it out against your against your available resources, both in people and money, and determine you know what's going to be most appropriate. Because obviously, we both think it's appropriate that they're on social media channels. But based on their resources, it may not be appropriate for them to be on all, all social media channels, right? They may not need to be everywhere. They may need to be on if they're highly if, if it's a if it's a product that you know it's mainly for women and it's very visual, then maybe they only need to be on Pinterest. You know, it just it just depends on what they're what where they are in that process and what kind of resources that they have so that they can make a, a decision that's gonna fit their business and then grow into more as they start seeing some success. But ultimately, they need to start somewhere. If, you know, anybody who doesn't think who thinks that you know digital isn't part of their business model, then they're not going to have a business model much longer, probably. So, um, you know, those that, that get it and start to understand it and can kind of recognize what's happening in, in the world, you know, just look around. People are staring at their phones, right? They're, and they're on there a lot of the time on social media. So, it's, it's, as soon as people can kind of recognize that, then it's, it's a matter of who are we, where are we going. What do we want to accomplish? How can we use digital to accomplish those things? Um, and then what's the kind of the process or the tactics that are going to fall in there to do it? And, and how are we going to measure it? Like, like you said earlier, if you're not measuring it, then how can you manage it? I mean, and I think one of the one of the things that uh, I run into a lot, um, and specifically ran into during my agency days, was that people have this notion that strategy is a big, heavy, complicated, clunky word, right? That if you have a marketing strategy, it's a 500-page document with like all these things that it takes forever to get by in. You can have a strategy that's one page. I'm actually a really big fan of document simplification. Yep. The tactics themselves may be a little bit more intricate, but the actual strategy behind them should have your overall business goal for doing this, a couple of objectives you hope to do that will help you reach the goal, and maybe some tactics and key measurements that you're looking for, and those can just be bullet points on a sheet, on a single document, sheet of paper. Um, you know, there's no reason that strategy has to be a big scary word or has to be something that takes you three months to develop. Um, it it really can, and I think should be a, a lot more simple. And I actually would say that that goes beyond small businesses. Enterprises need to learn how to simplify too. These huge decks with like 500 PowerPoint pages and you know, a ton of things really mean that everybody isn't unified around a one or two core principles that people kind of get scattershot and, and married to certain tactics or certain measurement goals. Um, so I, I really like to advocate for people kind of bringing it back together. Yeah, I agree completely. It's um, I think people 
I think it's pro primarily because of the agency space over the years. It's they've, they've kind of created that animal of the super expensive strategic documents, and because it's super expensive, it better be long because it looks like we've worked on it for a very long time, right? And in, in most cases, I don't think it. I don't think it. I don't think it is that. I, mean, I think it's what you're describing. I think it's that short document. It's vital to you for me. It's about purpose. You know, understanding the purpose. What you're, what you're measuring, what's, what's the goal, um, how we're going to accomplish it, and, and really, and on, on the core of keeping it simple, I think, is an important factor of making sure we're hiring the right people. Because ultimately, you can only keep it so simple if people don't get it. You know, and, and they have to deal with to really do critical thinking. And I think you know, critical thinking is something I look for, you know, number one when it comes to hiring somebody, whether it's a contractor or, a, or an employee. Because I want them to be able to solve problems and get things done and understand what we're trying to accomplish and figure out how to do that um, and find better ways to do it. Not just be the monkey that's pushing the button and you know doing what I've outlined for them to do. It needs to be much more, much more than that. If you really want to have a team that gets it and really have a team that pushes things forward and makes a mark both for themselves individually and the things that they're accomplishing, as well as for the company and their clients. I can't tell you how often I have this conversation internally about um, the application of knowledge, right? So um, I think it kind of goes back to what you were saying originally, which is people retain uh, information for a shorter period of time because it's just that, right? It's information. It's not knowledge because knowledge is something that you can go back to and pull from again and apply to other things. So because there's so much information available, there's less knowledge that's actually being retained and then applied. Um, and one of the things I'm having a really hard time with, you know, just as, as both, a, both a manager and a team member, is finding people who can create and retain knowledge from things that, from information that they find, and then apply that across various tactics, various goals, various strategies. Um, you know, it's it's a really interesting thing to see where kind of on, on an evolutionary scale that things will end up, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now. Uh, because there's a, there's a generation of people kind of coming up through the ranks that will become management that have a very different world experience than the one that we grew up in. Okay. Um, so I think that that's also part of the challenge of marketers is they're they're dealing with kind of information overload, lots of different channels, lots of noise, lots of things happening, a more discerning customer base because people do have access to more information, but the attention span of a nap, right? And you know we're gonna we're gonna see a lot of a lot of changes kind of come up. So speaking of changes, um, we've only got a, a minute or two left. So I want to close with your thoughts on kind of what you think somebody who wants to be successful finishing out 2014 and going into 2015 should really be focused on. Um, they should be focused on planning for 2015. At this point, it's late enough in the year. Most people should be starting their 2015 planning at this point. Um, and getting prepared for what they're going to be ramping up for. Um, if they've done a budgetary and planning process, you know, every year, then they're kind of, they're probably, they may be beyond the point, you know, budgetarily to make a lot of decisions the rest of this year. If they've got time, a bit, if they've got time and resources available, then they really need to, to dig in and, and, and determine what's really happening. What's the, what's the consumer behavior that they're that they're um, seeing right now? Um, what's driving it? Where are people coming from? Um, you know, how's it how's it lining up with our KPIs and what we're trying to achieve, and, and try, try, really try to get some data around what what they're doing so that they can understand and, and leverage that data during the planning process to make sure that they are, do things more efficiently and effectively in the new year, and um, can drive much more results for the business than they have today. I love it. Um, I think my hope for for people looking to kind of wrap up this year. Uh, and start next year off right is is to get set up to be successful next year whether that means making sure you have the right tools in place and that everybody knows how to use them whether that means creating a marketing strategy and a digital strategy that actually makes sense for the team that you have identifying where team members may be needed um, you know a lot of this kind of goes to you'll only be as successful as the, the the planning that you do, right? So it's kind of like running a marathon. If you look at every year, January 1, that you've got to run a marathon until the end of December, it's like if you didn't train before this, then you're going to be, you know, vomiting on mile four. And this is really bad, right? Yeah. Um, you know, because everybody explodes out of the gates 
uh, at the beginning of the year really, really strong. And I, I think one of the things I observe a lot of times, and this goes back to creating a strategy that's not so cumbersome that people can't kind of go back and daily look at it, is that I remember one time, you know, I, I got brought in to, to help a new client and, you know, they're talking about all this kind of like mess and they're explaining a lot of issues that they're having that are really just symptoms of a bigger problem. And the bigger problem, you know, I was like, send me all of your documents from last year, just send me everything. And I got this zip file that, you know, basically crashed my, my poor little MacBook Pro. And I started looking at some things and then I found this document like way in the back, you know, like nobody told me this, nobody kind of prioritized any of it. Open it up and it's their like 2010 marketing goals and objectives list and like their their presentation on what they were going to focus on. And this was the beginning of 2011 and I said, hey, I found this thing. How did we do like with accomplishing these goals that you laid out? And they're like, oh, oh no. And like, we don't know how we did with the goals we set at the beginning of the year. And they're like, no. And I was like, well, what have you been doing? And they're like, name out like 500 other things that they've been doing. And I was like, how did this happen? And a lot of what happened, which is always really disturbing and a whole other topic that we're going to have to do on another show is, well, so-and-so wanted us to go do this event and then so-and-so wanted us to like create this marketing thing and so-and-so wanted us to do this. And it's always like executive leadership kind of pushing and pulling or, you know, somebody gets shiny object syndrome and gets excited about something and then they get kind of waylaid and then they're not tying back how doing that shiny thing would help them achieve their goals. And so they don't say no because they either are afraid to say no to an executive or um, they get excited too. And they're like, hell yeah, we should definitely create a $500,000 YouTube video that has nothing to do with anything. Um, so I really hope that kind of in 2014, with the, with the time that everybody has left, like pick out the right tools, pick out the right people, make sure everybody's kind of on the same page and knows how to use it. Start developing that strategy and goals document. Um, and then take 2015 and actually check in on that thing, if not weekly, at least monthly and quarterly, to make sure that the efforts that you're doing today are mapping back to what you said was important for the year. Um, and I do recognize that sometimes goals change um, and that you may have to update tactics, but you can't just ignore them altogether. Yeah, and, don't, and make sure people shouldn't be setting goals that are annual goals, right? Let's break those down to quarterly or monthly so that you can really start to you can really track the progress and have a reason to go back and look at it and see if you're on track or not. Um, it, it's much easier to, to, you know, kind of keep tabs on, on those things so that you can ultimately get the data you need along the way to make the adjustments you want so you can make better decisions faster, right? If we want to make better decisions faster, so let's get the data we need to do that and be, be benchmarking along the way so that we can say, you need to make an adjustment here. What's working well and what's not? And you'll see people get really disheartened too, right? If they set, like, let's say a lofty goal to have a billion dollars by the end of, of next year and by the end of H1, like first half of the year, there are only at two million dollars and you're obviously not going to reach this goal. You need to realign this goal um, you know, and this is why, like you say, it's, it's important not to set this like huge, vast year end goal um, because then people are like, oh my God, we're never going to make it. Right. And then what happens is either people give up and, or, and leave because they know that they're not going to reach this goal or people start doing things that they know they shouldn't do to try to force the goal to happen. Right. Like people start employing kind of shady marketing tactics and all kinds of stuff. Um, so management and, and executive leadership need to be really sure that they're making sure that they calibrate goals based on a mixture of aspiration and reality, right? So like, there's a really important line there. Yeah, they, they, in a former company I was at, we used to use the term making sober decisions. Um, really, you know, not getting all hyped in, into the hype, but really make a sober decision that's going to be something that you know you can you can look at and it's. It's realistic. It's it's lofty. You wanna you wanna make take make goals. You know something that you have to really strive to achieve, but you need to make it something that is um, within sight. Totally. And on on that note, because it is Friday afternoon, and you just mentioned sobriety, um, I think that we will wrap up so that I can enjoy a tasty adult beverage. And um, I want to thank you for for joining us today. I think that this is going to be. Um, part of a continued conversation and I'd love to have you back to chat again about some of the things that I know that there are deeper dives we could really get into. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you for having me today. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, thank you.